Over to you guys. We're ready for you. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> Um, thank you, everybody, for attending our session. Um, we are all four of us uh, co-directors of Virtually Connecting, and we want to talk to you today about intentional and equitable hospitality. Um, so we kind of have two big concepts that we'll be talking to you about. Uh, what is Virtually Connecting and what is intentionally equitable hospitality? Um, first, we will uh, introduce ourselves. Um, so I'm Autumn Keynes, and uh, my Twitter handle is at Autumn, um, and I'll have uh, everybody kind of just say hello. Hi, <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, I, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm located, currently located in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, just across the river from Autumn, and been involved with virtually connecting over the, the past several years. Um, yeah, and, and a pleasure to be here. Maha, you want to go next? I'm, yeah, and I'm Maha Bailey. It just takes a while to get the video going. Uh, I'm Maha Bailey, and I'm at the American University in Cairo in Egypt. And hello, everyone from Berlin in Germany. My name is uh, Christian. I've been with Virtually Connecting for a couple of years now and um, been a co-director, I think, since October 2018, if that's right. Awesome. I will advance to the next slide here. Um, <clears throat> So Meha and I um, took on this slide. Uh, we have a provocation for the session. So before we even get started, we want you to sort of think about how you might have experienced or not experienced intentionally equitable hospitality um, and reflect um, on how you could or you would practice intentionally equitable hospitality for your particular context. So um, we will be reflecting on what exactly we mean by that. Um, maybe I'll let Meha um, maybe put it out in a nutshell. I thought that was coming in another slide, but uh, <laughs> but um, we just sort of break up each of the terms here. So we think about uh, virtually connecting as a space where we invite people to join and to be part of a conference, even though they're not at the conference physically, they can join in remotely. And so we think of this as a space where we need to be hospitable to people coming into it. And the thing is, if you just do hospitality as like a welcome without putting equity as the focus and being intentional about the equity, it's not going to happen unless you put in that effort and put in that thought. And I'm, I'm remembering the, the two presentations just before us are also about that. It's like being intentional about what the ethical issues are in the different dimensions and like being intentional of the accessibility needs in the different dimensions. We're talking about this but from the equity perspective. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how that is practiced in virtually connecting per se, but we'd like um, everyone else to think about their own context and what, where it would make sense to follow the same mindset. And maybe you already do, but that's not what you call it, and that's what we're calling it. Because we didn't think that there was enough in the, um, I think, e-learning literature to do that. That's awesome, yes. Um, <clears throat> And I will say that um, we've avoided putting like a strong, like one kind of definition on intentionally equitable hospitality. Really what's happening is we're a community of learners, we're a community of educators who are working together. And we've kind of noticed that we have this um, approach to hospitality. So we're discovering this as well, more so than kind of creating some type of definition and putting it out there. So um, we invite you to discover it along with us. I'm trying to advance the slide. Oh, there we go. OK, just a little bit of a lag. Oh, and then it double clicked because. OK. okay though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble with the controls here. All right, so I know a lot of people who are here today uh, know what virtually connecting is, but the main idea is connecting folks who can't be at a conference as if they're at the conference, and instead of um, letting them just watch presentations, it's more about the informal hallway conversations that you miss out on when you don't go to a conference. Hey, 
and just just noticing some of the comments in the chat about the you know you think of hospitality industry not necessarily in terms of, of something that is so grassroots and so um uh, I think in terms of the hospitality I show to guests who come to my my home, for example, and the, the roles and responsibilities that that entails. Uh, hospitality in terms of inviting students into a, a, an open online course as another example. So bringing those contexts into hospitality in open spaces and, and hallway conversations in conferences and, and how do you gather people in and ensure that everybody has a voice. So this graphic came out of some work that we did, uh, part of the Mozilla Open Leaders um, work with uh, Nate and Wendy, Rebecca and I, and we just reached out to the community and asked them, what, did, what does it mean? What does virtually connecting mean to you? And these are the, the kinds of terminology, the words that came out. Um, this graphic is designed, done in uh, a, a little app called Answer Garden which I use frequently with the students in my courses. It doesn't collect data. It doesn't require um, an account. Um, students can engage and provide um, quick feedback on a concept and, and what they're thinking. So I enjoy using this particular tool. So virtually connecting can be different things to different people. So we are connecting people who are usually on site, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, at conferences. Um, and so the value that we bring to them is that we're bringing a diverse, diverse perspectives to them. Um, I don't know if folks have experienced this before, but sometimes when I'm at a conference, I just feel like it's become an echo chamber of the people who are there. And so bringing in diverse perspectives of people who were not able to make it to the conference um, can be very enlightening. Um, and it broadens that collective conversation that's happening at the conference. And of course, for virtual participants, that's our main focus, is giving people access where there was none before, um, and allowing um, them to bring their voices to these spaces. So virtually connecting um, does does the, this this uh, technique of trying to capture the images of events and um, spaces and places. Uh, there is a Flickr account where a lot of people post their images, um, and it just reminds us that it's not about technology, but the the technology is the, the means and the mechanism to engage in the conversations. Um, and I like Sean Michael Morris's term I use frequently. It's we're having conversations through the screen, not to the screen. Yeah, I love that. So next, we want to talk a little bit about what we mean by intentionally equitable hospitality. And again, I will um, um, I'll just remind you, this isn't um, something that we have a hard definition for. It's more like something that we have discovered um, is is happening. Um, and I guess I won't claim that it happens every time or that it happens perfectly all the time, but it's something that all of us are striving for and continually growing through. Um. So again, this graphic is one that that I created um, early in my time with virtually connecting, and tried to capture a sense of we we often talk about this radical hospitality, a cultural radical hospitality, and we veered away from the terminology with with radical because of the negative connotations that are, um, are held globally when you talk about things that are radical. 
and really rethinking what what exactly is hospitality. And again, hospitality um, can sometimes take on a paternalistic or a um, um, colonial type of, uh, of um, terminology or thinking. So rethinking exactly what it is we're doing, actively doing, what are the moves and actions of being hospitable? So one of the things about it is this intentionally equitable hospitality um, is the way you invite new members in, the way we help them, the way they become active once they join, the ways of recognizing and encouraging the different what, modes and levels of participation, um, and, and considering all the time who's excluded, who's included when you make certain decisions, and going beyond just claiming to be open to all, but actually intentionally recognizing who can be disadvantaged in a certain space and how to center them in that space so that they're not marginal in it. Um, so you need to question your own values and we are constantly questioning our own values. If you've ever read any of the papers we've written about virtually connecting, you'll see that while we say, oh, this is the great stuff we hope to do, we always say, and this is how we keep falling short. And, and this kind of meaning evolves with time as we learn, as new people join the group. So if you think about those personas, um, that were being shared in the presentation just before us, there might be personas that we had not seen before that we had not been considering. And as soon as we see them, we modify our practice to make sure that we're, um, we're, we're addressing that by involving that person and deciding how we should do that. And then that shifts the power structures, I believe. And I think one of the, the ways that we consciously, intentionally do this is by inviting voices and and individuals who may not feel like they have a voice in a specific place. For example, inviting students consistently into the um, into the sessions and making space for um, people who, who are reluctant voices, they don't want to talk on screen, but still allowing them to participate in ways that they're comfortable. I think that's all absolutely right. There's lots of different ways that people can participate um, in virtually connecting. Uh, we do live stream all of our conversations. So it's true that there could be people out there who um, are just, consuming that content, but um, it's that um, active, intentional uh, welcoming of uh, asking people to come in and, and let us know about their, um, their, uh, their experience so that we can be more intentional about the hospitality that we're offering that's at the key, uh, kind of at the center of all of this. And sometimes that happens even before the sessions begin. It's it's the virtual buddy who brings people into the space and makes sure that everybody's comfortable in that, that um, space and, and get, gets a feel for what kind of engagement they want to have in that conversation. If they just want to listen, um, then they won't necessarily be called on. But if they do want to have a chance to talk, making sure that everybody gets gets an equitable share of the time in the, the conversation. And so <clears throat> a part of this for me, this uh, quote that's up right now is from a piece that I wrote um, called The uh, Praxis of Virtually Connecting, um, is also about uh, recognizing where we have privileges that um, can also be multifaceted. And so realizing that it's not enough for those of us with privilege to just show up, that we have to use our privilege uh, to create spaces for those with lesser time, lesser heard voices. And maybe that means listening and empathizing before speaking. Sometimes it means providing someone else with a means to have their voice heard. Um, and so I guess in my head, what that means is like, um, somebody who can't make it to a conference, right? Giving them a means, giving them a space, creating that space and inviting them in and making them feel welcome. Um,
sorry. Christian, do you want to, I think my connection is not so great. Can you do this slide? Okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, so to put this in more, let's say, for lack of a better word, practical terms, how, how does this actually work? So how do we make space? How do we try and, and practice intentionally equitable hospitality? So, uh, and, and one of the things is that lots of people who uh, are not as familiar as many others uh, with, with virtually connecting, uh, what they often don't see and what they're sometimes even not supposed to see is what we do in, in terms of pre-conference planning, for example. So we deliberately try and decide to which conferences we go to, who we want to speak to on site, but also who do we want to invite to to join a session um, uh, virtually. And um, this relates um, to, to the kind of planning that we do in, in terms of, for example, time zones. So if we want people from a certain time zone to be able to participate, when would a session um, actually have to take place in, in order for, for them to be able to participate, for, for them to be able to make their voices heard? Um, and also, and there's been plenty of that going on in the chat about imposter syndrome and, and all, all kinds of um, personal um, kind of mixed feelings about speaking up uh, on the internet being recorded and live streamed. Um, some people, um, if, if we just opened our doors, if we just opened our, our chats to um, our conversations to, to anyone and just opened our doors, um, I guess many people here would have an experience and a feeling of um, who would come and join us. So these are these might not be the people who we, uh, who we would feel um, that that need amplifying that need make uh, additional made space or or that that we would need to empathize with so who do we invite um how do we address that in different time zones what um sometimes that just needs a personal direct message or an email instead of a, an open uh, an openly visible tweet um so how do we invite people how do we promote these events for people not only to take part um in, in, in these conversations but also maybe just to to check out the live stream or the recording afterwards um, and also during a session, um, I mean, and we've we've seen the the OER people um, here from from all do a great job at that, making sure that everybody is um, from a technical standpoint that everybody can be heard, that everybody has a voice to speak up or a working mic or a working webcam, that the data connection and the the Wi-Fi, the internet connection actually works out in in a way that is sufficient for for them to take part and to help troubleshoot to help. Um, make um to help them claim claim space some uh, to some extent um invite people give them a, a proper briefing in advance tell them to download apps if they need to or to install a certain plugin in the browser uh, things that everything that makes um participation for for participants in and, and guests in our um in our virtual crowds and virtual among virtual entities as easy and as seamless as, as possible. So that's basically um, what these three phases are. And um, if we're doing a good job, if our community is doing a great job, some of this you won't even be, be able to, to tell if you're just taking part in a session. So, so just to sort of demonstrate some of the things, um, one of the things we realized early on is that when we post on our blog post that, hey, we're going to be at this conference with these particular guests, people um, who don't know us very well might retweet or like the tweet, but not necessarily say, I want to join. So what we do is if we notice that someone has noticed the tweet altogether, they'll say, hey, I saw it. Well, OK, this time I said you. But sometimes I say, hey, or Haya, or, or whatever. <laughs> um, I noticed that you tweeted, uh, are you interested in joining us? And then that, that's the way people get to know us. And then sometimes we start DMing and explaining what this is to people who might not necessarily know what it is and might assume it's sort of like a webinar that you watch rather than something you can be part of. And so going that extra step is one of those steps in hospitality for us. Autumn, you want to do this one? Yeah, and um, I'll just uh, piggyback off of what Meha said there. The, the way that we had that realization was actually in the very beginning when we were first forming Virtually Connecting. Um, we were still trying to figure all of this out. And it was really, um, I saw that she was doing that and I was trying to mimic it. And so I came up with a new term, what would Maha do? Um, <laughs> so that was kind of uh, our first realization of that. On this slide, we wanted to address the part about the planet a little bit. So um, at, at uh, last year's 
that we are 19, we got a shout out from Kate Bowles. Um, she was talking about the fly less movement and um, this movement to try to get people to fly less, to help with emissions, to keep down um, uh, you know, the emissions on the planet, to recognize that people fly so much for these conferences and are there other ways of doing conferences so it's um ironic right to be in this, this situation now with COVID-19 and we are seeing that emissions are falling right there's lots of uh uh reports out there about emissions falling because people are flying less um, and we are reimagining conferences and reimagining conference spaces. Um, it's important, I think, to point out that it's likely that that's not going to last. At least that's the, the reports that I'm seeing from scientists. So there is something to be said. I think we're virtually connecting in terms of thinking about conferences and thinking about ways to bring people in. It can also be a problematic phrase, though. We do a uh, problematic frame. We do worry about uh, this stigmatizing those who are furthest from conferences, who are a lot of times folks who are, don't live where I live, right? People who live where I live in the United States. Um, it, going to a conference inside of the United States is uh, a lot easier, a lot cheaper, and so there's more access there. And so we worry that this could set some unrealistic expectations. But this is a new line of thinking for us, and we're still trying to think about how how this might fit into our frame and how intentionally equitable hospitality might enable, um, uh, you know, less flying. <laughs> I don't think we'll have time for this one because I think we're just one minute over time already. Um, yeah. We, were, we just wanted to give people a chance to think about how you could apply intentionally equitable hospitality beyond virtually connecting. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that mm -hmm. happened to me in my context recently is that when we moved to pivot mm -hmm. online, we told people do more asynchronous text-based stuff, don't overload uh, students' internet connections. In Egypt, the internet is not really so great. But because of the social isolation, the students wanted the synchronous video chats because they wanted to see people. So even though in the more generic good practice of e-learning, it was don't do that, now the students really want that. So we pivoted into, OK, do it when you can, when your students can, you know, because they want that. They are socially isolated. So that's one example of a, sort of a shift there. And with us running over, yeah, maybe we should just invite folks to, uh, you know, think about this in terms of your own context and reach out to us at Virtually Connecting um, uh, and let us know if, you know, uh, we can help you in any way. But also, we'd love to hear if you've um, thought about this and maybe applied it in your own context somewhere. Oh, thank you. Thanks ever so much. That was such a brilliant session. All three of our sessions today, our presenters have been awesome. And I'm very pleased to say we were brave with the chat and the power of the hug just got us through it. It was really, really great. Thanks ever so much. Um, I know Maren's just headed off uh, because she's doing the introduction. So I shall just stop the recording and then we can all head over to um, our last session. So thanks everyone. I don't know if you like me, but I'm a little bit tired now, but still okay for the next bit. And um, been such a pleasure to, uh, to be part of this today. So thanks ever so much. Oh, I'm well done for getting up in the middle of the night. <laughs> Well done, Victoria. I know Kathy will sympathise with you there. So, um, yeah, really, really great badges all around for all the people that have got up at silly o'clock. So take care, everyone, and see you shortly. Bye now.